about six years ago, I was living the engineer's dream. <laughs> I was finishing my graduate work in robotics at MIT, and I was exploring the ways in which robots like this can influence human belief and behavior. But at the time, I had no idea that I was about to embark on a journey to explore a radically different way that humans can relate to technology. I had finished my <laughs> graduate work, and I got a great job in Silicon Valley, and on paper, everything seemed perfect. But thinking back on the situation, I liken it to having all the frosting but none of the cake. I felt like there was no substance in my life. Even though I had everything that I thought was supposed to make me happy, I still felt anxious and without purpose. So being of liberal leaning and having spent a few years as an undergrad at UC Santa Cruz, there, there was clearly only, only one option, the, the vision quest. And as my poor mom, who's out here in the audience, can attest, I really went for it. India, ashrams, many hours of meditation. And what I discovered was another world. I remember I was on a 10-day meditation retreat. We were meditating 14 hours a day. And it was day seven. I was sitting cross-legged on the floor. And we were doing a meditation where we were supposed to focus with a non-judgmental awareness on the sensations in our body. And let me tell you, there were some serious sensations. My back was killing me. My knees were horribly painful. My legs felt like they were going to fall off. But in an instant, everything changed. The sensations didn't go away, but somehow they were okay. There was nothing wrong. There was no bad and there was no good because there was no judgment. Somehow that part of the brain had shut off. And this wasn't a sort of psychedelic or mystical experience. This was the most clear, aware, and present that I'd ever been in my entire life. And what I realized and learned from that, even though the experience eventually faded away, was that we have an incredible potential as humans in terms of not what we can achieve externally, there's an incredible potential there, but in terms of the reality that we can live in, the type of consciousness that we can experience. And so, empowered and excited, I went back to the real world and tried to implement these meditation practices into my everyday life, but I found there was an inherent conflict there. Because these meditation practices, oftentimes developed thousands of years ago, were created in a very different cultural context. They were designed using a language written and spoken, because at that time it was the best thing that we had. But when I looked at the life that I was leading, it was very different. I was continually surrounded by technology and information that seemed to be pulling me in this other direction. There seemed to be this difficult situation that I couldn't resolve. And when I looked at it as an engineer, what I realized was that Meditation was a human invention. It's a tool and a technology like anything else. And it's here to serve us in a very specific way. It's here to help us explore, understand, and ultimately change our mind so that we can live a very different experience of reality. And that's when I saw a problem worth solving, something worth devoting my life to. I realized that there's no limit in terms of what technology can be, and I had been living as an engineer in this box. And I saw that technology could help humanity realize the same benefits that, technology, that meditation was trying to give us, and that we could use technology to actually get to the inner root of human suffering and get to the core of the fear, the greed, the selfishness in the world that starts here and is the cause of so much of the tragedy on our planet. And so, once again, I found myself on another vision quest of sorts. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. <laughs> it, it, there's, there's unfortunately no degree that you can get in enlightenment engineering. 
<laughs> yet, yet, I think it's, it's coming. Um, but I was inspired and I persevered. I traveled all over the world. I found some amazing re researchers to work with. And I not only explored the science of meditation, but I explored every technology imaginable that could be used to shift our conscious experience. Most recently, I've started a company. I've started building and designing devices myself to explore these ideas. And in this process, what I found is that we're an at an incredible time, both culturally and scientifically, to support a technological renaissance. For example, we're seeing an explosion of meditation or contemplative research in academia. Institutions all over the world are starting centers and putting an incredible amount of resources towards trying to understand the way that meditation and these contemplative practices affect the brain and the body. But what this does is more than just build a map, an understanding of the underlying mechanisms. Once we have the map, we can actually use that to navigate that space. Once we understand how this works, this is the classic relationship between science and technology, we can then build new tools in order to utilize that understanding. So in the same way that our understanding of biological science has helped eradicate smallpox from the earth, perhaps our understanding of contemplative science can help eradicate the inner causes of human suffering. Recently, some amazing research happening at Yale was exploring this exact idea. They did some preliminary work looking at extremely experienced meditators, people that had spent over 10,000 hours in practice. And they were looking at what part of the brain changes in these individuals. But they didn't stop there. They took that understanding and they used it to actually help teach novice meditators how to change that same part of the brain. And they use this machine called an fMRI machine. And what it does is it allows us to visualize what's happening inside the brain. So you can imagine a novice meditator sitting inside this machine, and in front of them is a screen. And what that screen is displaying to them is the activity inside their own brain in that exact part associated with meditation. And now, by having this visual insight into their own brain, a technology-assisted self-awareness, they can actually learn not only to control that part of the brain, but they can learn to change their present moment experience. <clears throat> this is just the beginning, but it's clear that a door is opening. And that door is opening not just to allow Eastern ideas into academia, that door is opening the other direction as well. At a major neuroscience conference, the Dalai Lama is quoted as saying, if it was possible to become free of negative emotions by a riskless implementation of an electrode without impairing intelligence and the critical mind, I would be the first patient. But these trends are hitting popular culture as well. We're seeing a wave of self-tracking and wearable devices flooding the market. This year alone, over four EEG devices for the consumer market were announced. These can actually read what's happening in your brain. Other devices promise to do everything from monitor how many steps you take to how many hours you sleep. But what are these, if not tools, for technology-assisted self-awareness, devices that help us to know ourselves. It's clear that there's a trend where the attention is shifting from out there to in here. But these devices around us still rely on the same fundamental principle of feeding us more and more information in the form of alerts, updates, charts, and graphs. But if we think about the way meditation works, it's not about more information. It's actually about getting out of the mind and embedded in a non-conceptual present moment experience. So can we imagine the devices on our desks, in our pockets, and on our wrists 
actually helping us right now in this moment to bring us back to this experience and to help facilitate the deepest, most profound experience of life. This is what I'm aspiring to. And uh, recently, I was working for a science and technology museum designing exhibits. And I wanted to explore exactly these ideas through the human heart. And so in my research, I had found that when people do certain types of meditation, yoga, even prayer, their heart rate changes in a special rhythm that you can measure. I also found a really fascinating research that sat two people that were in an intimate relationship down, facing each other. And over time, those two people's heart rhythm actually became synchronized with no physical contact just by looking at each other. And so I took these two discoveries and I created a system called HeartSync that's designed to bring an entire group of people into a synchronized state of this calming heart rhythm. And the way that it works is, and the way that it works is up to six people connect to special sensors that measure pulse. And a special computer program analyzes this information and it converts it into these visuals and the sounds that you're hearing. But these visuals are a direct reflection of each person's present moment experience. And by watching the visuals and hearing the sound, you can actually use it as a guide to help draw you back to that, to your breath, to the grounding in your body, to coming to here and now. And as the entire group becomes synchronized, as is happening right now, the visuals and the sound dramatically change. And if you notice, there's no charts, there's no graphs, there's no alerts and no updates. This is about you, your breath, and this present moment experience. So if you want to think of it as a game, it's a game where the only way to win is for the entire group to completely surrender. And so, <laughs> and so this, uh, this project is called Here Now, and it's a device that actually reads your brain waves and converts them into music. So you can think of it as a soundtrack for your mind. And through this sonic reflection, you can actually learn to know yourself more deeply. For example, you can become familiar with the sound of focus, the sound of meditation, the sound of mind wandering. But it's not just about knowing yourself. Because if you're feeling scattered, for example, you can actually surf this soundscape. And if you know what focus sounds like, you can actually use the soundscape as a thread to guide you to that place. But even these ideas are really just the beginning. The accomplishments of science and technology are truly staggering. We build incredible telescopes and satellites to peer out into the furthest reaches of space. We've built microscopes and particle accelerators to probe the smallest components of matter. But all of these explorations are phenomena increasingly distant from ourselves. But what if we flip that around? What if some portion of the billions of dollars, the countless scientists and engineers, focus their efforts on exploring the inner world, human consciousness? Perhaps that is humanity's next great frontier. And because technology is a manifestation of mind. It's our thoughts and imagination brought into physical form. If you look around this room, every object, even the room itself, started as a thought. And like our thoughts, technology can run wild, can cause immense devastation and suffering. Or it can be our ally to help us realize that which we all seek. Peace, truth, love, enlightenment, whatever name you want to give to that. But technology is here to stay, and it will continue to shape our world. So we as a society need to decide 
what kind of world do we want to live in? Thank you.